Yeah, but what about those kids that were running around downtown Chicago the other day beating up uh, tourists and, uh, you know, turning over cop cars? Or what about the high homicide rate in Detroit, in St. Louis, in Cleveland, in Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera? Who's committing those crimes? You invite them to count by race. You're going to count by race. They're going to count by race. At the end of the day, that's not an exercise that Black people can come out ahead in. You need to de-racialize the discussion. Hello, everybody out there. This is Glenn Lowry. You've tuned in to The Glenn Show. The Glenn Show is sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City, where I am John Paulson, Senior Fellow. And this week, my guest is Dr. Carol Swain. She is a political scientist, a former tenured professor at Princeton University and at Vanderbilt University, where she also taught course courses at the law school. And she is the co-author of a new book, The Adversity of Diversity, How Real Unity Training. Can you finish that for me, Carol? Can promote healing in a post-affirmative action world. But Glenn, I have to tell you that we changed the subtitle. And I believe the new subtitle that will be on the covers of books that are sold next week will be uh, how something like how the Supreme Court's uh, decision to end race-based um, admissions spells doom to DEI programs. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I got the idea. I got the idea. Uh, Carol Swain is, I think you can see, an African-American woman, an academic, uh, a writer, a speaker, uh, an activist. She's also a conservative Christian woman uh, who is uh, very outspoken with her views. <laughs> I looked you up on Twitter, Carol. Uh, your, your Twitter bio says political scientist, commentator, and best-selling author. God, yes. country, and family are critically important to me. My pronouns are, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> you know what do you mean something? By that? <laughs> Glenn, the people that wanted to silence me should have kept me in academia because there I could have done a little bit of damage. And since I left academia through the PragerU videos and media, I have reached millions of people. Um, Prager alone, over 70 million people around the world have seen my videos. And so, you know, my platform as an academic, you know, you reach a few people, but they should have kept me in academia. Carol is an old friend. Uh, full disclosure, I first met her, gosh, I don't know when. It would have been 35 years ago or something ridiculous I like that. I was an undergraduate when I first learned about you, and I used your research. And I believe that I cite you in my 1983 senior thesis on affirmative action that I quote from in the new book. Oh, wow. I got to I got to go look that up. <laughs> that was 40 years ago. So it's been a long time. Uh, Carol, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering. The Republicans had their first debate of the presidential election season earlier this week. Uh, I know you caught it. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I, last I heard you were a strong supporter of Donald Trump. What you make. Is that still true? And uh, well, in any case, you, what did you make of the debate? Well, first of all, I supported Trump in 2016 and 2020. And as, as a strong Christian woman, I did not feel led to endorse him or get behind him. So I, w I was doing the neutrality thing, trying very hard to be the neutral um, person because I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. And I liked Ron DeSantis. Uh, with uh, Vivek, Vivek, how do you pronounce his name? Vivek. Uh, I think I thought, he says Vivek. Vivek, Vivek. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with him, I find him fascinating. I believe he's the smartest person on the stage, but he's young and he's inexperienced. Uh, and there are parallels with Obama. But at the end of the day, I thought he won the debate. And so if you really scroll down my Twitter feed, there's a post that did not get a lot of interaction. And that was a clip from Godfather 3, where, uh, you know, Michael is saying, uh, just when I thought it was out, they pulled me back in. 
<laughs> That's how you feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I feel like when they um, uh, arrested Donald Trump and charged him with what I consider trumped up charges, and there's a black man named Harrison Floyd who headed Black Voices for Tr- Trump, And I have to tell you that I have spent my life not doing Black stuff. I was never in a Black student union. I was never a Black political scientist. For the most part, I've not done Black stuff in my life. But I made an exception for Trump. Uh, When they asked me to be a part of Black Voices for Trump, I was persuaded to do it. And, you know, maybe I didn't see any other role, but I wanted to be involved. And so I, I became a part of Black Voices for Trump. Harrison Floyd was the uh, director or organizer for Black Voices for Trump. And he's a young Black man, military background, um, a gentleman, everything I've seen about him. He carries himself like a military man. And I just love Harrison. He's probably in his 30s. He's the only one of the 19 co-defendants that's still in jail. And he's in jail because they are denying him bail. And so when I saw Harrison... This is in uh, Fulton County? Yes. And when I saw Harrison's uh, mugshot and um, and just, I mean, I I feel like tearing up now because it really hurts me. He's the only one in jail because he was denied bail. And it goes back to an FBI agent some months ago came to his home in Maryland. They said that he... uh, I saw one version where they said he shoved the FBI agent or he body, uh, one said body slammed or walked up to him and with his chest. And, you know, he was very upset about being served uh, a warrant involving January 6th. And so he was charged on state charges. They were dismissed, but then the feds charged him with a violent act. And, and so that was being handled in, the uh, federal system, he was a free man. He turns himself in in uh, Fulton County, and they decided that the black man, they did not grant him bail because they said he was violent. And all these Democrats that let murderers and rapists and anyone go free because they don't believe that you should yeah. post bail, they had this man, young family man, in jail because he headed black voices for Trump. So I was pretty upset, and I know that that's not the question you asked me, but that's where I am today, upset. Well, it's, <laughs> it's interesting that that would be the case you bring up because uh, my wife, Lawan, uh, whom I have mentioned here at the Glenn Show more than once, lovely wife, Lawan, uh, is a uh, liberal, uh, ultra-liberal, Carol. Uh-huh. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. Our politics are a little different, hers and mine, but uh, we don't disagree about everything. And she sent me uh, by email. We're in different parts of the house. She emailing over here. I'm emailing over there. The uh, story about this guy. of Among the defendants in the Atlanta case that is being brought against Donald Trump for messing with the Georgia election, the only one to actually get locked up it was a black man, black she dude. said. See there? She said to me, see there? <laughs> they racist. They're racist everywhere. And you come here with the same example. No, no, but the black people were too. the ones that put him in jail, not not the uh and and some people were saying, Well, why, you know, haven't they gotten him out? Well, at first he didn't have a legal defense fund, but he should not have been denied bail. And so you need to go back to your liberal wife and let her know that it was the, that he is in jail because he headed black voices for Trump. Okay. And, I, and I don't rule out going to jail. I don't rule out. I've never been arrested. I've always been a law abiding citizen, but I could be in jail. Like January, um, I was in Six. DC January 5th. Uh, we had had a meeting for the 1776 commission. And I was invited to be a part of the group because then I was still part of Black Voices for Trump. Uh, that was going to be a very nice place to stand outside in the freezing weather. And I don't like uh, protests and rallies and crowds and wondering where the bathroom is. And so as I was on the plane leaving to go home, there were people coming in for the rally. And I could have been in that crowd of people. And you didn't have to go inside the Capitol to be caught up in it and uh, and be forced to spend money defending yourself. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, I want to talk about the book, uh, The Adversity <laughs> of Diversity. But I got to ask you, why should self-respecting Black people vote for Donald J. Trump for president? How can you justify supporting Donald J. Trump? Don't you know that everything he stands for is contrary to the interests of Black folks? No, I don't know that. And guess what? By uh, arresting Donald Trump and indicting him on all of these charges, I think that it is it is building his Black support because if, if there's one thing Black people know about, it's getting arrested unfairly. <laughs> and so they have made a martyr even in parts of the inner city of Donald Trump, because we they already they already knew the system, you know, was broken, and so they see all these charges against Trump. So, um, it for myself, I'm not fighting right now for Trump. I'm fighting for the American system because due process, the rule of law. I believe that the Democrats, you take this home to your sweet wife in the other room. They have uh, weaponized law in a way that nothing holds. You know, nothing can be taken for granted. And so I don't rule out serving time in jail myself at some point. I wouldn't want to, but I'm not going to back down. And I was talking with a group of Blacks, uh, Black Republicans, and they were afraid at first. I shouldn't be saying this publicly. But people didn't want to get involved because they felt like that the feds are coming after people that were part of Black Voices for Trump, that if we stood up for Harrison, that they would come after us. Well, they're going to come after us if they want to anyway. I refuse to live my life in fear. I'm not wired that way. And so I've done a couple of TV shows, including Greta Van Susteren, about Harrison's situation, and I posted about it. And like the FBI knows who I am. If they want to start arresting senior citizens like me, <laughs> well, here I am. <laughs> I don't know how senior. I don't know how senior. You look I, great. I, I must say, for an old girl, you're looking really, really good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And as far as Donald Trump, yeah, I feel like he represents all of us. And I believe that, uh, that you know, you look at Biden and how corrupt that administration has been, and Black people were doing pretty well during the Trump administration. If you look at the employment rate, the uh, unemployment rate, and just all the things, the the gas prices. America was thriving uh, under Donald Trump. Let, let me mention, Carol, that Jason Riley, the editorial writer for the Wall Street yeah. Journal, has a book, a small book called Black Boom, in which he chronicles exactly what you just said, which is that in terms of employment and income and other indicators of social well-being, African-Americans didn't fare that badly under the four years of Donald Trump's presidency, in fact, did pretty well. So I just wanted to mention that, get that on the record. Well, they're suffering uh, now, and I have family members. I guess you know that, you know, I come from poverty. A lot of my siblings have not made it. Uh, I have grandchildren, and some of them have made better choices than others. And so there's a lot of suffering uh, taking place in the Black community right now. And all of these flash mobs and uh, restorative uh, justice and lenient, um, uh, um, um, what are you? Uh, lenient. Criminal justice policy and the yeah, DAs, the Soros DAs. All of these things. About? I feel like they hurt pe people. They hurt black people in the long run. And I have a very bright eight year old great grandson. And he's in circumstances where I just feel like there's almost no hope that, you know, I take him for a couple of weeks during the summer. I get him when I can, but I don't live in the same city. And it's just, uh, a hopelessness, the messages that they're getting. And Glenn, I've said many times that my success, I believe it came from the fact that I, I grew up at a time when people were looking for talented minorities, but the messages were, if you got an education, you worked hard, you could make something of yourself. And that was the case. And I never felt like because I was a black woman, I came from poverty, that I was disadvantaged, I was a victim. And I believe that all this crime that's escalated, and, and there are some crimes that young Black people are committing that they have not committed in the past. They're killing, you know, their grandparents. They're killing, uh, uh, you know, their mothers at a greater rate. And all of these kinds of things that are very similar to the worst of the worst, I think that the progressives would turn on them at some point, that they are allowing the, a state of nature 
uh, to, to exist in some black communities and our youth are getting such signals. And I don't believe the progressives care uh, because at, at the end of the day, when it serves their purposes, they are used that to really lock down on the black community. You don't think that um, there were some elements of racism in some of the support that uh, Donald Trump has engendered uh, through his two presidential campaigns, now a third one. Some of the uh, right wing extremists are uh, in his camp and are also anti black racist. Do, are there do you plenty give any in the, credence are, to that? <laughs> I think there are plenty in both political parties. And as far as uh, my experiences as being a black Republican, and I have officially been a black Republican since 2009, I left the Re- Democratic Party. Um, I, at first, I Just became as independent. Obama was coming on the scene? Pardon? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I said, just as Obama was coming on the scene? Uh, no, first, uh, after I had my Christian conversion experience uh, in the early 2000s, I became more conservative, and I shifted and became an independent. And ah. so I was an independent when George Bush appointed me to two uh, political appointments, and I was an independent when <laughs> Barack Obama renewed one of those appointments. It was uh, the Tennessee Advisory Committee to the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. So I can say that I've had three political appointments and one by Obama as well. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to ask you one of these debate moderator questions. Do you think that Joe Biden won the election in 2020? No. I think there were election irregularities and that the people who questioned that, uh, that they uh, were... I believe that there were legitimate concerns. I believe that Bill Barr and many of the people that were around Trump were sort of placed there. They were to keep him in check. And uh, and Bill Barr responded that there was no election uh, uh, a fraud or whatever his response was without a- even looking. And the kind of election irregularities and things that took place in the various states, you cannot get that data in two weeks or I mean, it has taken months of investigations for people that have uncovered what actually took place. And those cases that were dismissed, those cases were dismissed because they said the groups didn't have standing in most cases. No one even looked at the forensic data. So I do believe that the Democrats stole the election. And the fact that they've criminalized saying that they stole the election and Facebook and Twitter and all of those social media platforms would kick you off if you publicly said that the election was stolen. Including the platform that we're on, so watch yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you didn't say it, I said it. Seriously, (laughs) seriously, I'm just kidding. If they're going to take us down, take us down. All we're doing is talking here. It's okay to talk. People have different opinions about what happened in 2020. It's okay to have different opinions. So if you're going to, if she says, if you're going to lock her up, lock her up. And I say, if you're going to take me down, take me down. How'd they steal the election, Carol, in your opinion? I think that, well, I mean, there are many different ways. It was not just one way. Um, COVID, you know, was a godsend because they relaxed all the standards. And so when you have mail ballots and you have people doing ballot harvesting, and I can tell you, Glenn, from personal experience uh, and with my relatives in Virginia, I had some relatives lived in uh, the projects, <laughs> never voted. They had people come to that door, knock on that door, several people knocking on the door with ballots asking them to fill out the ballots and stand in there where they uh, filled out the ballots. And so the ballot harvesting was just ripe for um, fraud. And then the Zucker box, Zuckerberg boxes, where you did not always have a chain of command, you had people picking up the ballots and taking them. And then, I mean, I remember election night, I'm watching and Donald Trump is just, you know, he's at, the, he's just... I don't know. I mean, he he's he's doing well. I'm so excited because, Glenn, I almost always get it right. Like people ask me what I think. I almost always get it right. Very few times have I gotten it wrong. They And I had um, I was asked before the election if I thought he was going to win. And I said, yeah. And so I'm all excited. And all of a sudden there's a report that a pipe was burst in Georgia. My heart sank. Because I knew, and then they said they were going to stop counting. When they said that, I knew that that was phony, and then that was fishy. And then the next thing I knew, it was reports that they were going to stop counting for the night. And so I never, ever heard that happen during an election. 
And then the next morning I get up and everything's flipped. And, uh, and so, I mean, that was suspicious. And then there were so many reports of trucks, you know, pulling in. There were some postal workers that said that they were told to, back, to backdate um, ballots that came in. And, uh, and so there were so many reports and there were so many ways that they could have influenced uh, the election. So it wasn't like one particular way. Oh, and I kept getting phone calls uh, from Georgia telling me uh, to vote in the Georgia election. I, I live in Nashville. I've never lived in Georgia, but I was getting these robocalls telling me to come vote. So yeah, I definitely think the election was stolen. And I think that they will do it again if they can. And I believe that many of those, uh, now I'm getting on dangerous territory. And so this is me saying this. Uh, and I believe it's been documented that some of those um, voting machines were hooked up to the internet. And I can remember as a political scientist reading years ago about how easy it is to, uh, when you're doing electronic voting, uh, depending on who's programming, to be able to wait a ballot in a way that it flips in a certain way. So it all depends on who has access. If Republicans wanted to cheat in the same way with um, the electronic voting, they could if they had access. I can also tell you that when I ran for mayor of Nashville, the second, first time I came in number two, that was a special election. The third time, no, I only ran twice. First time came in number two. There were when more I than ran two in candidates. The, pardon? Among I'm saying there were many candidates. candidates. You were you came in number two. No, no, there were about 12, 11 or twelve candidates, yeah. and uh, Republicans are a minority in Nashville. But they thought, because of the circumstances, that you know that I could win that special election. So I had support. Uh, and then I ran in the general election. I came in number three. But when I went to vote, I went to vote for myself, and they had changed the voting machines. Uh, they had switched over. And I could not find my name. And I had to go to the second page and scroll all the way down to the bottom to find, find Swain. When I voted the first time, all the mayoral candidates were on the first screen. And you could easily find, you know, Swain was up there with everyone else. They had changed it. And, um, and then I voted recently. And I uh, put in my... Uh, my information and the screen. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. I had to get someone to come over and help with the voting machine. So there's so many ways to cheat. Okay, now I'm not endorsing your argument that the election was stolen, but I am noticing that a very experienced, uh, very accomplished, uh, well-educated, well-trained political scientist who happens to be of color and a woman thinks that the election was stolen. And if you think that a lot of other people also think it, and I think that's a very significant thing. <clears throat> I have to tell you, Carol, the case that you just made sounded circumstantial. Yes, there was a pandemic. Yes, there was a lot of mail-in balloting. Yes, Mark Zuckerberg did finance nonprofits to go around and knock on people's doors. Yes, ballot harvesting does allow for the possibility of the kind of persuasion at the front door that you were just talking about. But we have courts. There's due process. The president was free <laughs> no, to bring his case. Glenn, Glenn no, there's not due <laughs> and, process and any longer. And he didn't longer. prevail in any of those court proceedings. The, no, the, so, they, yeah, the cases were dismissed. And I think one of the most serious things that took place is that if an election is stolen, it takes so long to actually do the kind of investigations. And yet you're going to hold up the country. Are you going to hold up the process while you investigate it? And so I think that whether it's a Democrat or whether they say Republicans stole an election, that in the past people have known, OK, let's just go away quietly. And Donald Trump did not go away quietly. And that's the problem. And that's why he has to be punished. Uh, and everyone that agrees with him, they have to be punished because they did not follow the uh, tradition of, OK, you need to go away quietly and try again next time. And maybe next time, you know, you'll get away with it. Uh, what do you say to this? And I've made this argument for the sake of the country, whatever the merits of his claims, once he uh, exhausted the remedies available to him through the courts, he should have gone away quietly, notwithstanding the fact that he believed the election was stolen for him for the sake of the country. That would have been the right thing to do. I don't think that's so, I think. because I think that uh, that that's what you expected to do. That incentivizes it. And what I have come to believe 
is that there is no remedy at law for stolen elections because the process doesn't allow for it. You, it, the process allows for Democrats and Republicans, you know, okay, you got it, just go away quietly. And so he didn't go away quietly, and that's why he was, that's why he's been hounded and arrested, and that's why those 19 co-defendants, you know, they, I'm sure the charges against them will be dismissed, but in the meantime, the money that they have to spend defending themselves, and like Harrison, he has a defense fund, I think, Yesterday he had he was up to twenty eight thousand. He's trying to raise a hundred thousand, but people have had to mortgage their homes and you know put themselves at risk risk of bankruptcy, all because they either worked in an election or they served a particular uh, candidate. Um, and I think that is unfortunate. That's a, you know like anyone say Donald Trump were to get elected again in twenty twenty four. Who's going to follow him into office knowing that the Democrats are going to sue you? Uh, you know, they, they're going to sue everyone they can sue. That's how they use the law. The law means nothing today. And I hate to say this, and I've always loved my country, and I've always believed that America was, you know, something that I, today I would tell you that I'm not so sure that the America that I've loved all my life ever existed. Oh, how can you say that, given how good that country has been to you? It, the America it has that you been good to me. So, but, you know, but I'm just telling you that when I see what has happened to America, I don't recognize my nation. I don't recognize my country. And when I look at my um, uh, my young people, as well as my own great-grandchildren, uh, I, I'm not optimistic at all about their future. And so oh, I'm, I'm sad. To I'm sad today, and I'm just very sad. And it's about America as much as anything else. And as far as Donald or J. Trump, I'm not sure that that um, you know, like the people that hate him will kill him if they get a chance. But I also believe that uh, the weight on him, what he has had to go through, like I don't see how anyone stands up against all that pressure. Uh, he seems to thrive on it, but it's Did you killing see a lot of the rest with, of us. You see his interview with Tucker Carlson uh, that was broadcast at the same time as the debate? I watched the debate because I really wanted to see the other candidates. And you asked me about, uh, you know, how could I support Donald J. Trump? When I uh, if criticize Trump, it's because he has had poor judgment. He's always surrounded himself with the wrong political appointees. And and then he endorses people like, you know, Mitch McConnell, um, Lindsey Graham, uh, 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 the, Ronald, the, the uh, head of the RNC, just people that are not necessarily conservative. They're not sharing the values he purports to share. And so I think there are a lot of contradictions with him. Uh, and so I have been... I'm not sure what to do, but I was not hesitant to get involved when I saw the travesty that took place with his being arrested with 19 co-defendants, including Harrison, who is in jail unjustly. And so I believe that of the candidates, it was a bunch of midgets on the stage. And Ron DeSantis really disappointed me that someone would look around the room to decide whether or not to raise their hand. I mean, I don't, he's not the person that I thought he was. And so then you're sort of stuck, if you're a conservative re Republican, with Donald J. Trump. And the fact that they hate him so much is uh, it's probably good news for us because it means that he's right on the mark about the deep state and about the things that um, he's tried to warn us about. But he is far from perfect. And I just wish that you could take DeSantis and Trump and sort of blend them together and come out with the perfect candidate. I mentioned the interview with Carlson because Tucker asked him directly, uh, did he, was he concerned about being assassinated? Not in those words, but no. to that effect. Said, you know, you're a threat to, you're the one person who the deep state would fear because if you got power, you clean house. They're not going to stand for that. And that kind of talk is very terrifying. I mean, I know, but look what happened. I don't to know John how F. our Kennedy. country survives an assassination of someone 
in the position of Donald J. Trump. That, but there are that, people trying to destroy our country. I mean, they don't care. They would do anything to uh, destroy America, what's left of it. And I think that there are people that wouldn't care if we had a race riot. They're not trying to save America or strengthen America or make li- the lives of racial and ethnic minorities better. And so I believe they believe the ends justify the means. They want, you know, globalism. They don't care about America. And if taking out Donald J. Trump, uh, they believe that solves their problem. But if you look in uh, the case of biblical martyrs, when you take out a leader, it's not just biblical martyrs. Uh, you take out someone, they become bigger in death than they were in life. Now, people on the left would say the real uh, impetus to violence in our politics is coming from the right. Oh, I know. Uh, they, they would say. talk about militias. And you've studied uh, right-wing extremists, uh, uh, anti-Black racist uh, figures in your own academic work. What, what do you think about that? Do you agree that uh, there's a serious threat uh, coming from the right in, in terms of uh, terrorism, domestic no, terrorism, no, no. and, and you, you anti-Black remember, racism? Lynn, uh, I wrote uh, The New White Nationalism in America, Its Challenge to Integration. It was published by Cambridge Press in 2002. And uh, it was a warning about the future, but I argued that identity politics and multiculturalism you know, was creating a new kind of white nationalism. And it was not the old style uh, KKK or neo-Nazis. Uh, uh, it had to do with people that were concerned about white people, that were concerned about discrimination. And I argued that the new white nationalists were not people that were espousing violence or that type of thing. They were citing FBI statistics on black crime. They were uh, pointing out that white people were being discriminated against and that uh, their rights were being trampled. They were talking about racial double standards. They were um, laying out basically uh, an argument that I thought was persuasive, especially for young people. And I felt that we needed to move away from identity politics towards the American national identity. And the concluding chapter of that book had talked about America as a whole, but it also talked about what Black people needed to do. And I felt that um, uh, what I feel now is that there was not enough old-style white supremacists or neo-Nazis or people espousing violence for you to maintain that white people were racist. And so what the left has done is redefine what is a white supremacist, what is a white nationalist, because uh, there were not enough. And so pretty much you could argue that any white person that doesn't go along with the woke agenda is a white supremacist, a white nationalist. I don't think that's good for our country. So what I have seen is redefinitions so that they can actually have a larger group of people. And when you start targeting, you know, military people and Moms for Liberty and just these various groups that uh, have pushed back against the progressive ideas, all of these people are white nationalists if they're white. And they even call in black people like me, uh, black white supremacists. Uh, and so, but to Carol, me, the word, the what meaning, about the, that church in South Carolina where a young man went in there and shut it up? Or that market in Buffalo, New York, where a young man went in there and shut it up? They, these were white supremacists. Yeah, you can always find, yeah, but uh, the problem is that there are crimes that are taking place among and across different racial and ethnic groups. But they're not, they only focus, the media focuses on a few. And so it's whatever the, the media chooses to focus on. And that was an issue when I wrote The New White Nationalism, because there were plenty of incidents where white people had been targeted, multiple white people killed by racial and ethnic, by blacks, and it didn't get media attention. It wasn't even classified as a hate crime. And so that was a grievance about the racial double standards when it comes to criminal justice issues. If black crimes against Asians and whites got the same attention as uh, the white isolated cases, I think we would be having a different discussion. And the discussion would be about crime. And so I think the people that actually hate other racial and ethnic groups to the extent that they would kill them in mass numbers, that has been few. But I think what the left is doing is trying to divide whites and blacks and Hispanics and Asians and various groups in a manner that it will generate more hatred and more distrust uh, of one another. 
And I felt back, I argued back when I wrote The New White Nationalism that uh, that I believe that we were going to have unprecedented um, levels of racial turmoil because there were grievances that were festering. And if I wanted to create a race war, I would do exactly what the Democrats have done with race and with crime. I would do exactly what they have done, what Obama did. And so I'm not talking about um, that. So my book, The New White Nationalism, it was a warning, 2002. Yeah, well, I... And affirmative I, action was a big part of that book because that was one of the grievances uh, that white people had. And I, I want to I want to get back to affirmative action, which is yeah. what your uh, your uh, the diversity adversity is about. But I yeah, but yeah. I got to say wanna, this: I want to hold up my book. <laughs> yeah, hold it on up. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody, see that? There she is. Uh, now First I've been, been on for the cover while, of my own book. I, I want to agree with you about something, which is that uh, there's a lot of black on white crime that doesn't get reported in those terms. And if you are paying attention and you were framing the discussion in racial issues, people who are worried about white people being attacked by black people would have a lot to say. There'd be a lot of things to be worried about there. I've said we don't need to defund the police. We need to de-racialize the discussion about policing. You say that um, uh, uh, Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis was a racist cop. I say he was a cop who engaged in bad policing. You say that George Floyd was a victim of racism. I say he was a man in the wrong place in the wrong time. He shouldn't have been killed out there on that street, that's for sure. But his blackness didn't have a whole lot to do with it. And I say, if you insist on counting by race every time there's a criminal offense against a black person by a police officer, you invite people sitting in their suburban kitchen to say, yeah, but what about those kids that were running around downtown Chicago the other day beating up uh, tourists and, uh, you know, turning over cop cars? Or what about the high homicide rate in Detroit, in St. Louis, in Cleveland, in Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera? Who's committing those crimes? You invite them to count by race. You're going to count by race? They're going to count by race. At the end of the day, that's not an exercise that Black people can come out ahead in. You need to de-racialize the discussion. But Glenn, so it, they view. come out ahead because the mainstream media doesn't report the uh, black or white crimes at the at the same rate. They almost never report them. And the George Floyd incident, there will always be a George Floyd Floyd incident. I think the left has um, a, a bunch of cases. They can always play them up when they, when they need a case. And usually during an election year, they will find something. And when we talk about George Floyd. Like if you watch the whole video of how long, you know, he was in the car before he got out of the car and and the first autopsy, all the things that were in his system. And it seemed like he was dying uh, already when he was in the car. And it's it's unfortunate that that uh, cop, uh, you know, appeared to kneel on his neck because uh, the, the optics. But at the same time, the autopsies, the family got two additional autopsies to be able to to make the claim that the police officer killed him. And so uh, the left has used that. We have a chapter in the book, uh, The Adversity of I'm sorry to interrupt, Carol. He he had a trial. There was a jury of his peers. They examined the evidence and they came in with a guilty verdict. I know about uh, juries and I know that in these race cases, there's a lot of pressure. We had a case in Nashville involving a young police officer. He was 25, and the black man he shot was 25. And the man that um, that he shot had a a gun and a criminal record. The mayor, on the night of the shooting, went to the mother of the black guy and told her that he was going to get justice for her son. The um, white police officer followed uh, policing because he said, at at any rate, he was following his police manual, and they... uh, the prosecutor said he had the Nuremberg defense. And so they ended up um, paying the family even before the young white guy had his trial, giving a settlement to the family. Then he was uh, convicted. I think he was uh, sentenced to three years in prison. And then uh, they quiet or jail, they quietly released him. But he didn't get, get a fair trial based on the facts. And the mayor had already said, oh, and then the first judge refused to... Um, 
to indict the police officer based on the evidence, and they went around and found another judge, judge shopping. And so um, that uh, got attention in Nashville. Okay. I want to talk about the book. You, your co-author, Mike Toll, who is he? Uh, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. He's worked with me. Uh, he, he, he was a sports writer with the Tennessean. Uh, he's a... Well, he's younger than I am, but he is in his 60s. And uh, he's an editor and has been involved in the publishing world. And you may have noticed that my book is published by Be The People Books. But Mike is really, the book is my book. Mike uh, helped, and we're going to do some co-authored books together. But he is the person that actually uploads the book, does the pagination, and hires the cover designer. And he knows all aspects of publishing. And the book is self-published, and Black Eye for America was self-published, and I had my own imprint called Be the People Books. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be a whole conversation in and of itself. As a man who just finished my uh, autobiography, which is being published by Norton, W.W. Norton and Company, which is a mainstream publishing house, uh, I'm, I'm now in the throes of trying to, you know, how do you publicize the book? You know, do I hire a publicist or something like that? You know, and I'm negotiating and all of that. So um, you have to yeah. sell the book yourself. Uh, and I made a lot of money from Black Eye for America because I cut out the publisher. The publisher sort of like the um, casino, the house wins <laughs> in, in many cases. <laughs> what is this previous book? No, I'm sorry. What's the title? Blackout? For America? Is that what you no, call it? I, I think you know about this book. Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House. It was published in 2021 and um, by Be The People Books. And I sold 30-some thousand copies. Okay, congratulations. And uh, and so, like, I take on the cost of, of publishing the book, but I use first-rate editors, cover designers, and Mike knows how to coordinate all of that. He was a sports writer for years, and he's also uh, an editor. He, he's written on his own probably about 20 books. Sorry for the disruption. Um, I had some technical problems with my computer, so I've switched to another computer. We're continuing the conversation. And Carol was talking about her book, The Adversity of Diversity, and about her earlier book. And what was it again, Carol? A New White Nationalism in America, It's Challenged Integration, published 2002 by Cambridge University Press, nominated by the publisher for a Pulitzer Prize, and it included interviews of 10 white nationalist leaders. They were conducted by a white interviewer. Okay. And then there was another book about uh, oh, critical yeah. race theory. Yeah, you, you're not familiar with this book, uh, Black Eye for America, a critical race theory is burning down the house. It's my bestseller. And it was self-published by Be The People Books. Okay, I admit to not being familiar with it, but that's my that's I will my send problem. you a copy. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Let's talk about the adversity of diversity. Well, the adversity of diversity... This builds on research and ideas I've had for a long time. In fact, I quote from a 1983 a senior paper that I wrote at Ronald College. I believe that you're quoted in that uh, paper as well because I became aware of you while I was a student at Ronald College, and I reached out to you back then. And in that, um, there's a chapter uh, in the book it talks about my affirmative action. Um, uh, my, it, the title is Carol's Educational Journey in an Affirmative Action World. And so I was born in 54. That was Brown versus Board of Education, but also the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. I was 11 years old when Johnson gave his famous Howard University speech. And in the 70s, when I started college, affirmative action was very much around. And so I've seen it uh, from very many different uh, uh, perspectives. And as far as this book, five years ago, I started a book, Why Diversity Training is All Wrong. And I was very troubled by the fact that the big corporations 
were being politically correct and they were firing their CEOs and various people because of some statement that may have been made that uh, was considered racist or was labeled as racist. And I felt that um, the DEI that was being brought in did not contribute to racial healing or reconciliation or the mission of the organization that is very disruptive and that there was a better way. And in this new book, The Adversity of Diversity, I build on the Supreme Court decision of, of, um, that involved the Harvard and North Carolina cases that ended race-based affirmative action in higher education. Uh, the book was 90% written before, those, uh, before the case was decided. In fact, had the Supreme Court ruled differently, the book would have had to have been substantially uh, rewritten. And the title would have said that the Supreme Court missed uh, an opportunity uh, to bring about, um, you know, basically a better America to, to, to put us on uh, the right path. And what I argue is that DEI, diversity, equity, equity, and inclusion, violate the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause and our civil rights laws in the same way as race-based uh, college admissions, and that the Supreme Court decision dooms every DEI program because they, too, violate the law. And it's not just about race. They violate uh, the law when they have programs that uh, demonize men or demonize Christians, or demonize groups that are protected by our civil rights laws. Help me to understand this, because I, I understand affirmative action, racial preferences violates the Constitution because it invites discrimination to individuals otherwise similarly qualified, get different treatment based upon their race. That's discrimination. Right. How is the idea that I would try to educate my employees whether or not you agree with the uh, program of education to uh, have a more commodious and uh, respectful workplace uh, equivalent to discriminating against people in my hiring decision. Well, uh, that, first that's of a, all, I take that position. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the limit is uh, that I would be invoking constitutional principle in order to, uh, you know, to limit or uh, prevent uh, speech. This is speech. The diversity, okay, well, equity, and inclusion seminars all are right. speech. I, I mentioned to you that we had changed the subtitle, but the subtitle now is How Real Unity Training Can Promote Healing in a Post-Affirmative Action World. And the position of the book is that there's nothing wrong with non-discrimination, equal opportunity, recruitment, outreach, compliance with existing laws. And um, and I think that most Americans would agree with that. But diversity, equity, and inclusion programs have increasingly become not about uh, diversity as we think about it. And I know that you're familiar with how it was done some years ago that di di diversity meant that recruiters went to under underrepresented populations. They went to historically black colleges and universities. They went to high schools. They made people aware of opportunities and they sought talented minorities. And so uh, diversity at one time, it was a layer on top of affirmative action, but it was about bringing in underrepresented groups. And then once you got in, and Glenn, we both went through the same regime, we had equal opportunity. We had an equal opportunity to, to succeed or fail. Equity is all about equal outcomes. And you look at the Biden administration and how they tout all of these people uh, that are in positions. And the first thing they talk about is their identities, their sexual identity or their race identity. And they don't seem particularly qualified for the job that they're in. Uh, as I, my experiences with affirmative action was that it opened the door, that people got into institutions. Some of them made it, some of them didn't. I would say that DEI is all about the group representation. It's about canning the beans, and it's not encouraging people to integrate into the 
uh, workforce or into the environment. In fact, the affinity groups and the inclusion is about people maintaining their separate identities. And part of what I argue in this book is that in the workplace, we need to get back to the mission of the organization. Every organization was set up for a particular mission, whether we're talking, talking about the U.S. military or or corporation like Bud Light, you know, they're supposed to be selling beer. Uh, <laughs> we can talk about Target, they're selling merchandise. All of these corporations have become involved in DEI programs that have pushed political agendas. They have divided the workforce and they often create a conflict and turmoil. I would argue that they create conflict and turmoil because they come from uh, a worldview that is pretty much rooted in cultural Marxism. And I would say that let, it's let me, not... Let me, let me stop you for a minute. Let me stop you, Carol, because there's just so much on the table. I know. And we're run, and I feel like we're running respect, out of time. I don't but don't think you... We've got as much time as we need. With respect, okay. I, don't, I don't think you addressed my question, which is affirmative action is one thing. Right. Racial preferences, preferential hiring or admissions decisions that discriminate against individuals. Diversity and equity and inclusion seminars in a corporation or a university or a, an administrative structure is another thing. It's about, let me say, and this is not my argument, I'm just making right. this for the devil's right. advocate. It's about encouraging dialogue amongst my employees that sensitizes them to the complexities of racial uh, uh, situations in which right, right. you could be giving offense and I'm, and I'm trying to get it so that people can get along and they can understand each other better. And so I've got a seminar going here. I'm calling it Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. You may or may not like it. You may think it's a bad idea. You may think it's ineffective, but it's not unconstitutional on, on its face. It is rather my effort to train my employees in a manner that I think is most consistent with the well uh, functioning uh, of, my, of my workforce. And so, why, Let me you know, the Supreme then. Court decided. Affirmative action was inconsistent with the 14th Amendment. You're now, it seems to me, saying a seminar in which my employees of various races get together and I have a coordinator who tries to walk them through the complexities of contemporary race relations is also unconstitutional, and I don't see that. Well, I hope I can uh, help you to see it. Uh, I'm concerned about the corporations and the colleges and various places where they have set up DEI programs, and they have forced uh, attendance uh, at events. And we have many videos and reports of situations where white people have been demonized because they are white people. They have been told that they need to shut up and listen, and it's mandatory, and there's a berating of people because of their, um, their race. Sometimes it's their sexual identity. But they are being uh, harassed at times based on immutable protected categories. And what has happened is that there have been some successful lawsuits from white people who have been discriminated against because of things that took place at the workplace that came out of these trainings. And so part of my argument is that there's nothing wrong with um, uh, employees or or. CEOs and leaders finding ways to make sure their employees know the civil rights laws. Uh, because we have laws protecting women, we have laws protecting uh, racial and ethnic groups and, um, and, and people of, uh, with different sexual orientations. We have protections, but those protections protect men as well as women. And, and there's a new case, a recent case where uh, a man won against a white boss that told him in front of a group of other employees that he needed to man up. Uh, and so that uh, he was able to win his suit on that. But the DEI and CRT people seem to believe that they can say whatever they want if the person being addressed is a white person. So many of these successful cases have come from people that have uh, openly said you know, that you are, you know, evil or, or, or they have told people that we're letting you go because we need to hire someone from a different group. 
And sometimes they've named the group. We need more Blacks. We need more Asians. We need more some other group. That is something that's prohibited by civil rights laws and the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And so what I argue is that we can have workplace diversity without discriminating against groups. And that ideally, you would not, uh, I don't believe that anyone should be forced to attend some type of diversity training. That if you want to attend, it should be voluntary. And there's been some research, in fact, some of it was co-authored by people from Harvard, that the diversity training, it doesn't really work. It tends to harden um, uh, people's attitudes. And and here's another thing we find is that, and I, well, you find that a workplace can be, you know, pretty operating smoothly, but you can bring in a DEI person and what you end up with is minorities that were pretty happy with their jobs. All of a sudden, they feel like they should be further along. So they become disgruntled because they didn't know they were a victim of systemic discrimination. And you have white people that feel like that uh, they have been berated and harassed for things they had nothing to do with. And so what this happens is you have disgruntled employees. Some of them quit after they've been forced to attend the sessions. They may have been valued, valuable contributors to the workplace. My goal is to bring about um, a, an environment more consistent with e pluribus unum out of many one where people are working together, they can know the civil rights laws, but they also are reminded that they are there for a purpose. Every organization has a mission. They should be part of a team to further that mission. That a program doesn't work well, what Frank Dobbins, the Harvard sociologist that you were just mentioning, finds in that paper, doesn't mean that it's unconstitutional. No, but I'm saying uh, that it's reached the levels of unconstitutionality in okay. many cases. And that's why more and more corporations are getting rid of their DEI programs. And after George Floyd's death, uh, billions of dollars were poured into sensitivity training and DEI uh, programs, and they're quietly getting rid of some of those people. And that can be at their own risk if they don't have something in place to make sure people understand civil rights laws. So I believe that they need um, to make sure that their employees know the, how to how to protect the civil rights of other people, but they don't need to be forced to go through sensitivity training where you call out certain people because they happen to belong to a group that is supposed to be responsible for systemic racism or whatever the DEI trainer wants to focus on. I also uh, believe that Many of the DEI trainers are people that um, they're not that knowledgeable. In fact, I, anyone can hang a sh shingle and say that they are a DEI trainer. There's no licensing that takes place. Uh, and I would imagine that there would be a large percentage of people that maybe they have their degrees in some ethnic studies or women's studies or some uh, field that ends in studies. They go to corporations and they have more power than the affirmative action officers that used to give lip service to our civil rights laws and to the Constitution. And so they have a lot of power and they can be very disruptive. And we have numerous examples and we have some uh, interviews of uh, CEOs or business owners that talk about how they have handled particular situations. Do you think that if a company were to announce we're especially interested in recruiting minorities, racial minorities uh, into our employ and we'll be making a uh, effort to do exactly that while uh, maintaining uh, uh, equal application of our standards. But nevertheless, you know, recruitment, outreach, advertising, it's a special effort. You see anything wrong with that? Well, Best Buy is being sued because they have a management training program that only uh, accepts uh, racial and ethnic minorities. And that may have come out of a, an equal employment opportunity. No, I, of, excuse me. I'm not saying that. I, I'm saying having the objective of recruiting, not having a discriminatory process, but having a goal that says this, is a, this would be a good thing for our company to have more 
uh, underrepresented minorities employed here? No, I mean, my book is not arguing that companies can't uh, be sensitive to their own desire. The owner um, may want a wor workforce that looks like America. Uh, so it's not saying that you can't do that. It's really pointing out ways that people have done it that's clearly discriminatory through their DEI programs, that for the most part, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been closely linked to critical race theory. And I don't know what you think of critical race theory, but it has become, uh, uh, it has been implemented in a way that has been very discriminatory against certain groups. And I think that we can do better and we can have more harmonious workplaces by um, using a different approach. And so that's pretty much what my book is about. And I do believe that the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Harvard and North Carolina cases that ended race-based affirmative action has clear implications for the DEI programs that are violating the Constitution and our civil rights laws. There may be some that aren't. A lot of them are. And they need okay. to rethink what they're doing. And companies are going to be sued increasingly. There are a lot of lawsuits now. And I think uh, white people, for the longest time, now, I was a political scientist for almost 30 years. When you talked about civil rights, white people thought about racial and ethnic minorities. And I've had so many people that were white say that they didn't know they had civil rights. They don't, they don't think of themselves as having civil rights, but yeah. now they do. Now they do, and I think that uh, the critical race theory and the aggressiveness of the left has uh, caused white people to sort of become more aware of their own rights and the fact that our Constitution protects all persons and that they are persons too and they have rights too. And, and as a consequence, more people are stepping up to the plate to exercise their own uh, rights when it comes to the law. Now, I'm sure you are aware that the Biden uh, administration has issued an executive order instructing the entire federal bureaucracy to embrace DEI type orientation. You think that's unconstitutional? I, I definitely do. And I also think that he has helped destroy our military because they're so focused on, you know, how, how many trains in the military, they're having drag shows. Uh, there are things that are taking place in the military that has nothing to do with their mission, which should be to keep us safe from foreign and domestic threats. And so, yes, I do believe that the Biden administration is in violation of our civil rights laws and our Constitution. That it's, um, <laughs> I think the administration is just totally, um, just, it has no grounding. Um, or should not have any grounding in our, our laws because it has violated so many. And those executive orders, I think that it's like um, um, a way to get votes. It's all about votes. They don't care whether or not the executive orders are constitutional uh, because by the time someone challenges the executive order and it's declared unconstitutional, maybe uh, the votes have been gotten. It's, uh, it's almost like position taking and signaling without regard to the law or the Constitution. Okay. Now, you have a law degree. You've taught in law. I have a master's in law and a PhD in political science and, and degrees in criminal justice and, <laughs> and, and business. I didn't ask you all that, but okay. <laughs> but for the record, is, I'm, is I'm not a I'm lawyer. I'm not a lawyer uh, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but... Um, I um, stayed at a Holiday Inn Express once, and with these ideas, I have spoken with many um, people, you know, who are constitutional law professors, and I'm confident that I have it right, and I'm confident that what I put forth in this book would improve organizations and that there's a better way. Uh, if there's a message, there's a better way to have diversity, and you can have it without discriminating. I was uh, mentioned you uh, your legal background because uh, I noticed that Alan Dershowitz wrote a foreword for your book. He did, and I I don't I'm not sure I ever met him in person. I think I've spoken uh, to him maybe once or twice, but I was deeply honored that he would write that foreword. 
He says he doesn't necessarily agree with everything, but he thinks your voice is important. Well, he had to say that to cover himself. <laughs> Just like you have to say that on the podcast to make sure they don't take you off. <laughs> okay. So there are two black sitting justices of the United States Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas and Katanji Brown Jackson. They issued uh, concurrences and concurrence in the dissent. Uh, how would you contrast those uh, respective arguments from African American uh, sitting? court members, and uh, which you regard as the, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I want to hear you, if you don't mind, uh, just give me your brief uh, okay. reprise on how those two opinions contrast with each other and, and which do you think is actually the, the more uh, legally correct in terms of in well, the 14th Amendment. Thank you. Well, with the book, I have the Supreme Court decision in the appendices as well as Clarence Thomas's concurrent opinion. I do not have Tanya Brand's uh, uh, op dissenting opinion in the book uh, for, for many reasons. And I'm sure you're aware that she has been attacked um, for not getting the facts right on things that were stated in her opinion. And I see her as one of the Blacks, you know, that they've gone through elite institutions. They have totally absorbed the progressive agenda that's why she couldn't define what a woman is, uh, because um, she, you know, if she defined what a woman is, uh, then she would get in trouble with some of the uh, groups that the Democrats support. And so, with Katanja Brown, I feel like unfortunately we have a, a generation of young black people that were recruited into elite institutions, and they have been so heavily indoctrinated that they're not very critical thinkers. I don't believe she should have been confirmed and placed on the court. If the Democrats wanted to place a black person or a black woman, I'm sure that they could have found someone that was better qualified, uh, even among their ranks, that would have a better understanding of the law. And so I was not impressed by her doing the confirmation or anything that she's done on the court. And if you're just somebody that has been heavily indoctrinated. You have no critical thinking skills. All you have to do is regurgitate whatever the the your side wants you to regurgitate. I, for me, I want intellectuals on the court, people that are going to agonize and grapple, and they're going to see more than one side, and they they're going to be unpredictable because a lot of times when you grapple with ideas, you know, you surprise yourself. Uh, sometimes you don't come out in a predictable way. With her, I see no evidence that she's that intellectual that's going to be able to uh, come out in ways that Clarence Thomas and some of the other justices, you see that they wrestle with ideas. I suppose I should be trying to defend Justice Jackson here. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a lot I, I don't of information think, I think about we can agree on background. what kind of person we'd want on the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, we well, don't want You remember partisan. when Ilya Shapiro, uh, the legal scholar, made a comment prior to her confirmation that um, when Biden announced that he was going to appoint a black woman to the court, he said, you know, you really should go for the best legal mind. You're going to right. end up with a lesser uh, black person on the court if you do it like that. Black women are a small percentage of all the population of lawyers, if you restrict yourself to 3% of the population, you're probably not going to get the best. And there was a firestorm of, uh, of a critical reaction to that. I think he got suspended from a position at Georgetown Law because of that comment. Uh, as an African-American woman who you acknowledge uh, has been a beneficiary of affirmative action in her career, do you not worry that uh, this kind of um, uh, stereotyping of affirmative action beneficiaries as being less than fully qualified is something that could be very injurious to Black people. It has been since. all along. And I don't say in the book that I was a beneficiary of affirmative action. I say I was a beneficiary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that ended discrimination and set up an equal opportunity uh, uh, requests that I think we both benefited from, that people were on the march searching for talented minorities. 
Uh, I went to a community college. I didn't need affirmative action to get into a community college. I didn't even need my GED to get into the community college. I made the dean's list. I went to Roanoke College, a Lutheran school, predominantly white, working full-time nights and weekends. I graduated magna cum laude because I was smart enough to check out books on how to write essay exams, how to take objective tests, how to study. I worked very hard. I applied those principles. I graduated with honors. And so the schools that I got into, I got into, I didn't go from the community college to Harvard. I went to Roanoke College, you know, which was down the street. I met their admission standards because I had done well at the community college. So I benefited from the goodwill of people who were searching for talented minorities who pushed me into academia. I had no interest in going into academia, not even sure that's what I should have done. But, um, and so I think non-discrimination, equal opportunity, compliance with the with existing laws and outreach, that that is what benefited people like me. And that's the way it should be. And and I never say and applied here, for minority positions. When I when Harvard when um when hold, hold, on, uh, just hold, hold on, hold on. I, I just want to get on the record. Because we we're not exactly contemporaries, but uh we we both came along. I was born in nineteen forty eight. Are you older than I am? Really? I'm older than you, Carol. I didn't know that. Uh, But I just want to say this. I don't know that there's any African-American who came through uh, higher education and especially elite higher education in the 19, late 60s, 70s, into the 80s, who in one way or another wasn't touched by affirmative action. And and I I hate this. Well, you can't change because everything you accomplished. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Let, let Let me just finish this. I mean, I was also a community college student. I ended up at Northwestern University on the north coast of Chicago uh, as a scholarship kid. I was a dropout from college who went back to community college. I had two kids when I was at Northwestern and a wife. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that I benefited from their desire to have more Black students in their student body. They reached out to me. I was 22 years old. When I enrolled as a student, did I just say that I benefited from uh, people that were looking for talented minorities? I've said that several times, and so uh, we can call that affirmative action. I don't want to get into semantics. We no, but let's say this. Let's say this, Glenn. I can I can also attest to the fact that everything you've accomplished and everything I've accomplished because we are black is totally dismissed. It has to be affirmative action. So when I won the Woodrow Wilson Prize, the highest prize a political scientist can win, the career prize for political scientists, uh, it didn't it it didn't count the same as it would have counted if I had been a white male. And so when you are black and people know that you're black, they may advantage you because of that. It's nothing you can do about that. But for that's myself, my point. yeah, that's I, my I, point. Agree, I that's we can agree true. on that. Carol, that's also true. Katanji Brown Jackson. Yeah. OK, well, there's so we can all agree on that, that that's one it's also of the, true. It's also true of Clarence Thomas. He talks about that. He's been very open about that. And I think we have to be open about it. And um, and I was saying that when I applied to. For jobs. I would not apply to any position that was a minority advertised position where they would invite three people and they would compete against one another. Uh, I felt that was very demeaning. And there were some jobs that I would not apply for because they expected me to compete against other Blacks. And um, I thought I was better than that. And so I've I've wrestled with affirmative action ever since I've been in college. That's why in 1983, I wrote a paper on affirmative action. I was critical of it back then. And I was a Democrat at the time. Okay. What else you want people to know about uh, uh, the adversity of diversity? I want them to know that I believe it's one of the most important books that I've written. I, I right now, uh, you know, books that I believe that the general public, you know, should be able to read. And so they're not that long. They can get through it very quickly. And it's well sourced. I document like a political scientist. And I believe that um, the book is well worth anyone's time if they care about race in America or if they care about uh, what's happened 
with the DEI industry. I believe we can have diversity without discrimination. Okay. Uh, I think we have given you an opportunity to sell your book, and I'm happy to have done so. This is my old friend, Carol Swain, who joined me at the Glenn Show this week. Carol is an author, a speaker, uh, and she is a former professor at Princeton University and most recently at Vanderbilt University. Uh, she is a conservative Christian African-American woman. I'm proud to call her my friend. Thanks for coming on The Glenn Show, Carol. Thank you, Glenn.